Amen. As the deer panteth for my soul, for the waters, so my soul panteth after thee. I believe, Adrian, you got blessed on that song. I believe God is doing something in your life that you got blessed on that song because we know that God has been good to you. And no one can tell you how good God's been unless they walked in your shoes. And so we bless you. We want to welcome those who are watching and we are live on Facebook so y'all don't show out today. <laughs> God bless you to our Facebook family, to my dad there in Dayton, Ohio to our friends at Calvary Baptist Church there in that city, to all of our loved ones and to our children all over the country, to our college students who always take Sunday afternoon off and they watch me. And I'm going to double down today. So if I get a text this afternoon without a parent calling, we're going to give them a $75 gift card if they can outline my sermon now, those of you all sitting in the room, I'm telling you, God likes the honor system. Don't you call your child and say, I got to wait for you to make $40. <laughs> and so we are excited about our opportunity. I want to talk to you about touched, transformed, and impacted. Called to make a difference. My world looks like these guys in these suits trying to juggle being a family man, trying to juggle being a corporate guy, and juggle being a pastor. But how many of you know God's job is the primary responsibility? And so God calls us and puts us in a place where we can do things in life to make a difference. Time sure flies over 11 years. And today I stand to be able to speak and share with you that uh, sometimes we have a tendency to evaluate the outcomes of our ministry when God is always interested in the incomes of our ministry. It's not how much you can show what you've done. It's how many people get into the kingdom as a result of what you've done. Somebody say amen. amen. Somebody's counting numbers and God is counting saved souls. So it's important for us to understand. And surely growth is a signal to measure our success. However, God is bigger than that. And God has always put me to the point where he says, what did I call you to do? What accomplishments have you all done? What impact have you made? What legacy have you left behind? Who is waiting on you to fulfill your God-given purpose? As I take a look back and begin to reflect last night, got up a few times and to think, and I look back at the 39 days I spent taking coffee to the ICU ward and to a man who coached my daughter, whose daughter had wrapped her car around a pole, pronounced dead, brought back to life, was basically in a coma, and I brought coffee to Brittany, and I prayed with Brittany for 39 days, and on the 39th day, she woke up, and now I think she's friends with Portia on Facebook. She loves the Lord. I'm excited. I dedicated 39 days to go to a hospital and drop off coffee, coffee and to pray. I looked at the young men that we created a basketball team for, and we Gave them hope. Many of them had dreams of going to the NBA. But I remember when I came one Sunday, one of the young men and his family came and says, I've got a scholarship to Fresno State. And I was glad that the church was in the basketball business. I remember bailing another man out of jail in El Paso, Texas, driving him and flying him back to Indiana and helping him get his first start, his fresh start. He'd had a lot of things going on. He wanted to start this school for basketball players. I even sent my son back there for a year, and my son texted me, and I saw La Lemure High School playing for the national championship for the U.S. And I can say that our church had a, a foothold in starting that. And Darren probably wants to get credit because that's La Lemure started on your year that you got, went there. I remember being asked by a senior woman to help me bury her husband. 
And I asked her, sure, but you remind me of my grandmother, can you play on first Sundays? And Mother Parchment has been a blessing to me over the time. I remember paying or praying for members, a member's co-worker. Her name was Karen. She had terminally brain cancer, and so the co-workers all brought her here from AT&T. I love it when corporate America fears God. And all her co-workers came to church, and we prayed for her, and she went to Stanford, and the number one neurologist in the country said she is going to die in three weeks, and she lived for a few more years. I believe God is amazing. And then her mom called me one time. She says, you know, the most amazing part of that journey is I walked in and my husband and my, uh, I believe my brother who it was, he, he walked, he says, who's that black man on Karen's bed? I had went up in between business meetings and I drove over to Palo Alto, sat on the bed with her and her daughter and prayed with her. I remember God moving and I remember kneeling in the church office with Chinichi and her two kids and she was dying of cancer. She says, Pastor, I want my children to be saved and born again. And we prayed the prayer of faith with her kids there in the office. I remember holding Felicia's hand. She called and says, Pastor, can you come? I think my grandmother's about to pass. And we stood there and in a circle by her mom's bed and we held hands as her mom went from this life to eternity. I remember the times that God calls us to do ministry. And there's been so many ministries, so many things that we've done. I remember the wet suit that Sam and I would put on and go into the baptism pool and he would go in first because he's a deacon, he's a servant, he wanted to test the water before I did. <laughs> and we baptized many of your children here that they might have eternal life. I remember the good, the bad, and the ugly of church, of religion, of families, of people, of politics, of money. But I also remember that God called me to do something. A prophet's call, a minister's call to consecration is one of a life-changing event. And many of us have those turning points and we happen to take our neighbor across the street for dinner and I felt like I was at Dr. Phil. Because ultimately he wanted to ask me for all this time that we've been neighbors, why are you a pastor? It's so painful to say that why I'm a pastor. Many of you have life transitions that are so painful, you don't want to go back to those board, those markers, because they bring such pain. But I want to tell you, God will give you a marker in your life to let you know that you're called for a reason. So I share with them the tragedy of growing up without my mom by my grandmother and having to deal with my brother who was dealing with homosexuality who got AIDS and that God was working in his life and God used me to, to help him get into the kingdom of God. I told him that's my story but that's why I'm not comfortable sitting at dinner tables at restaurants sharing my story because it's a painful place that God called me and shook me and got my attention. Many of you are going to be shaken in life, but God wants to get your attention and says, you are called for a reason. I want you to turn to Isaiah 6. And we're going to go Isaiah 6, 1 through 13. And, you know, I told myself I wasn't going to be long, but I'm going to be as long as I need to be. We'll get you out of here before the Super Bowl, amen? Some of y'all didn't get that. That's a whole year, you preaching. If you have it, say amen. amen. Isaiah 6, we see a prophet coming on the scene. And it reads as follows. I'm reading out a New Living Translation. It was in the year that King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord. What? He was sitting on a lofty throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim, each had in six wings, with two wings they covered their face, two wings they covered their feet, and with two wings they flew. They were calling out to each other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's army. The whole earth is filled with his glory. 
Their voices shook the temple and the foundations, and the entire building was filled with smoke. Then I said, it's all over. I am doomed because I am a man, a sinful man. I have filthy lips, and I live amongst people with filthy lips. Yet I have seen the king, the lord of the heavens, armies. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal had taken from an altar and a pair of tongs. He touched my lips with it and said, see... This coal has touched your lips. Now your guilt is removed and your sins are forgiven. Then I heard the Lord asking, Whom shall I send as a messenger to the people? Who will go for us? I said, Here I am. Send me. And he said, Yes, go. And say to these people, Listen carefully, but do not understand. Watch closely, but learn nothing. Harden their hearts with these, of these people. Plug their ears and shut their eyes. That way they will not see with their eyes, nor hear with their ears, nor understand with their hearts are turned to me for healing. Then I said, Lord, how long? How long will this go on? And he replied, until the towns are empty, the houses are deserted, and the whole country is a wasteland, until the Lord has sent everyone away, and the entire land of Israel lies deserted. If even a tenth of remnant survive, it will be invaded again and burned. But a terebinth, a terebinth of an oak tree lives, leaves a stump which is cut down, so Israel stump will be the holy seed somebody say amen I want to talk to you about a little dialogue here because I believe if you're called for a reason God wants to get your attention three things that the prophet did he looked up he looked inward and he looked outward if you're taking notes carve up your page and let's fill in the blank he looked up he looked in and then he looked out when God get ready to move you you're going to always have to have some dialogue with God and then after you have some dialogue with God, you're going to have to have some dialogue with yourself. And then God's going to send you with yourself after talking to him to go bless somebody else. And so when we see he looked upward, there was an amazing vision, a lot of metaphors here, and we can spend a whole day. But fundamentally, Isaiah sees the Lord upon high. He sees angels around, and this awesomeness, God is so amazing. He fills the temple. His train is so overwhelming that it floods the room, and he cannot see a face. He cannot see a person, but he, he feels the presence of God. Don't you know it's good to be in a place where the presence of God is so overwhelming? You don't have to see a singer you don't have to see a pastor you don't have to see a musician but you just feel his train feeling the temple he sees this and he begins to look around and this subconsciously he he looks at this higher source and he's he's saying man something's going on here i know i'm called but 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 the bible says they put a marker in time they put a a 9 11 moment they put a my brother has aids moment they put you have cancer moment they put you got an unemployed moment the bible puts a marker in the bible says in the year that king uzziah died i believe that god put a marker in there so that he would remember his turning point. When did you turn around for God? He puts a marker in the sand and says, that year you trusted the man, a king, to be your God. I showed myself when he's dead, the God of God is still alive. That year in which the king who made a way out of no way for you, the physical realm was taken care of, the spiritual God took over and let you know that I am controlled. There was a marker in your life. You've got to identify and then take action. We see in verse 5, he, he, he then begins to look inward. He's in the presence. You know what? Uh, Minister Reese, I, I understand why people don't like to come to churches who are filled with the Holy Ghost because they get antsy. They get shiny, shiny suits because they squirm because in the presence of God, you're going to have to respond to something. That's why churches are afraid to be, have the Holy Ghost in. That's why we're afraid to preach the truth because we, 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 we want people to be comfortable. But in the presence of God, there's an interaction that goes on that will call you out. And so after he looks up, he looks inward. In verse 5, the Bible tells me, he, he, he says that, uh, uh, then he says, it's all over, I'm doomed. For I am a sinful man, I have filthy lips, and I live amongst people with filthy lips. Yes, I have seen the King, the Lord. Has anybody ever uh, uh, been someplace where you felt like, I don't belong? 
Immediately, the prophet says, I'm unclean. I've got a filthy mouth. I'm no, this, it's hard to ask questions in churches because everybody's so holy. No one's ever said anything foul out of their mouth. No one's ever texted something. They, would, they no one's ever emailed. No, no one's ever said anything that's bad, so it's hard. But imagine being in a room with people who have had a filthy mouth. Could y'all imagine, if you would, please? I know some of this whole song, oh, I don't remember. But he says, I'm here, and then not only am I here uh, with uh, uh, my own issues, but I'm living around people who got equally bad issues, and so the filth of my community is even overwhelming me. Even when you're holier than thou, you've got a community of people who aren't holier than thou, and the mess that they're in can come over and hit you even though you're doing right. So he says, I, 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 I'm a person that's unclean and, and I don't know what to do. I'm a sinner. I'm not good. I'm not worthy. But, but God, why are you talking to me? What's going on? And God says, I, I want to use you. I want to use you. But I'm dirty. And I'm unclean. Oh, I, 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 I'm an unclean vase. And, and God wants to pour clean water into a dirty vase. I'm a dirty vase. How many of y'all are dirty on the outside? And you've, been, you've, you've had issues. And, and, but God says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use you anyhow because even though it's a dirty, the vessel that you are, Isaiah, is dirty. I can still pour you out and I can use you and drink. Ah. Somebody say, well, that's dirty. Isaiah, your outward man and your past mistakes and issues are the vessel that's going to carry my word. But let me tell you, my word is clean, regardless of the vessel. Oh, Y'all didn't get it. I know you have a filthy mouth. I know you have some issues. But I'm going to pour something inside you that you're going to have to pour out. That's going to be clean, even though it's touched your vase. There's some of you who are afraid to move forward for God because your past is so ugly that you're afraid to pour out. And God says, I'm bigger than your past. I'm bigger than your sin. I'm bigger than your mistakes. Let me pour into you and do you pour out of me what I give you. And some of you are afraid for the call of God because you look at what the world has called you versus what God is calling you. And so we see he's having this dialogue and then all of a sudden, he looks outward. Yeah, I'm a sinner. Something's about to change. And then we see in verse 8 through 13 this crazy dialogue. Then I heard the Lord asking me this question. Whom shall I send as a messenger? Who? We've danced all this around this on vision, haven't we? Who's going to be my runner? Are you going to be the steel runner? Are you going to be the treadmill runner? Are you going to be the runner running the wrong race? God says, who's going to be my messenger? And remember, the voice of the Lord is speaking out over the heavens, which means an angel could have signed up for the job. Before anybody else could volunteer for the position, the man who had been delivered and rescued immediately decided to take the job. Many of us are slow to respond when God calls out to Lake Forest. God calls out to Orange County. He says, who am I going to send? Well, let's see how they, la see how they do. Let's see how they last. But there's a sense of urgency here. He says, send me. He had a ready answer, full of self-abandonment. Clearly, he had no clue what the job description was. He took the job knowing that it could be tough, but he did not calculate having the job based on success. He said, I trust the God who is the author of success. Some of the assignments you're going to have, people are going to tell you what it's supposed to look like. But God says, go do my assignment, and I'm the one who measures what it's supposed to look like. Isaiah, I'm getting ready to give you a tough job. Can you imagine having a job where you're supposed to go out and do something, and it's going to look worse when you leave than when you started? 
This is the word here. Y'all going to work with me for a minute? He, 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 he says, I want you to go. What do you want me to do, Lord? Here he is. He says, send me. And he said, yes, go and say this to the people. I want you to tell the people to listen carefully, but they do not understand. Watch closely, but there will be no learning. Harden, they will harden their hearts of the people. I want you to harden their hearts. I want you to plug their ears. and I want you to shut their eyes. I want you to keep doing all these things. He goes on and on. He says, I want you to get yourself in position where you are able to then to be able to speak to people who aren't going to listen to you. You're going to be able to speak to people who aren't going to respond. You're going to be as a professor in a classroom. You're going to be as a parent. You're going to be as a co-worker. You're going to be sent to give the gospel to people who don't want to hear you. Orange County doesn't want to hear us. But God said, I'm going to put you into a place where you are going to have to deliver a very tough message. Anybody have ever delivered a tough message? And he goes, okay, I'll go. What do you want me to tell them again? I want you to tell the people that... Uh, their world's going to get worse. They have not been listening. They've not been hearing. They've not been abiding in me. And now they're, they're going to come to a bit of destruction. And I want you to walk them through this, this scenario, Isaiah. Isaiah says, well, I don't like that job. No. I don't want to go there. I don't want to deliver that message. I, I want to be more evangelical. I want to be one to lift people up. I want the one where the crowds are filling the place. I want the places where they're shouting, Isaiah, no, that's not your assignment. You've got to know your assignment so that you can know when you're victorious. You've got to know your assignment so you can know when you're on track. Because people who don't have the right assignment will use outward measures to navigate them. They'll get outsiders to tell them how they should go. Only God can give you the direction. Only God I can tell you what's good and bad and so he gets to a place and he says Lord what do I have to tell him he says I want you to give them this word but they are not going to hear it then he says how long don't we always ask God how long we got to do something now how long do I have to sign up to be a part of the usher committee how long do I have to sign up to be over a ministry how long do I have to go and preach how long your calling is for a lifetime Someone says, you uh, are retiring. I said, I'm retiring from Second Baptist South. I said, but when I was driving to Arizona to go look for a house because my wife couldn't pick from 10, I had to narrow it down at least to two. I said, Holy Spirit, give me two that she would like. The Lord began to put some more stuff in my head and I began to feel God moving in me. I said, no, 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 I don't want that feeling. No, 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 I don't want to do that anymore. No, 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 turn around, go left, go to Barstow, not to Phoenix. Please, God, no, 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 no. But whenever God has a problem, he's looking for someone to send. And when you say, send me, he's going to send you. And if you are worried about success, if you're worried about outcomes rather than incomes, you will never take the assignment God has for you. That's why I'm confused why people pick churches versus God picking them to be at a church. Why are you going to a place where you're comfortable? You may have to go to a place where you're uncomfortable to do what God has called you to do. I want to go to a place that makes me feel good. That will go to the donut shop, Starbucks. But your calling may put you into a place like Isaiah where it feels like, man, it's tough. And then as he's looking outward, the Lord begins to shape out what it's going to look like. He says, they're not going to be listening to you, Isaiah, when you're done. They're not going to even want to care about what you have to say. And then Isaiah, I'm going to take it all the way down. You know, the million, I'm going to take it all the way down to a tenth of the people, all oh, Jesus. And I'm going to take that tenth, something about tenth of anything. Then in the Bible, we study the tenth. Somebody says you give a tenth. Who did the offering today? What is that about giving a tenth? What is that called a tenth? Huh. God says, I'm going to give a tithe back to humanity. I'm going to take 
a tenth of the children of Israel, and I'm going to pour it back into mankind. Watch what God does. And he says, I'm going to bless the tenth to bless everybody else. See, 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 y'all was, whoa, we, uh, uh, that, that sounds like a stump. It's going to be cut off, but it's going to be cut off so that it can be a seed to bless something bigger. And then he says it's going to be a stump. And then in my commentary, it talks about a stump uh, of a timber tree and an oak tree. And, 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 and the problem with a stump or these type of trees is that these trees, the till tree and the oak tree, the real value of those trees are in its wood, not in its presentation. <laughs> so, 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 the, the teal tree and the oak tree, they don't like those trees. People like those trees because when they shed their leaves, they're not big and fluffy. They provide no shade. But the teal tree and the oak tree have to be chopped down to become a beam to hold something up. Have to be carved up to be a door frame. Have to be carved up to be a window frame to allow wind to come in. You know if you're the right teal or the oak tree and you get carved up enough, You'll be placed in a place where you will provide more value than standing around making shade. And so he gives this prophetic little thing here that I want to say to Second Baptist South for a minute. Then I'll do my evangelical, get y'all, some of y'all get saved, and then we'll move on. Do not be concerned about how people have responded to our mission. The Bible says they're not interested in coming and hearing the truth. They're only interested in coming to hear what makes them feel good. You've stood true. And then don't get concerned because you had 10x this size when it started. <laughs> I only needed a tenth to tithe back into Santa Ana. That tenth will be a seed to bless something much larger than you ever anticipated. When you get cut up, stop worrying about being cut up. Because your cutting up is needed to be something more useful than being something all of this. We, 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 we have brilliant consultants we're helping us on this journey. But to the consultants, God is switching an assignment. And the strategic plan of any biblical assignment comes from heaven, not from man. And so as we come together, God's going to drop something off on the spreadsheet that has more power than we've all even thought about. Some things are going to get cut up and look like they've been cut off. But the oak tree cannot be a beam unless it's been carved up. And I believe God wants to do something in Orange County. That's amazing. But he needs individuals who understand their calling and their call for a reason. So to the masses, I say to you, you need to look up and determine why God has you where you are. Tell your neighbor, look up. I know they sleep. Hit them. Look up. It's important that you go to God and say, God, what do you want me to do? And if you volunteer and say, send me, it's a lifetime assignment. I wish I could retire from what God called me from. But what God called me to is connected to my blessings. And I'm not about to give up what God has given me for the sake of locality. That church is going to be hot physically. I have no idea. But if God gets me over the hill and says, I want you to do that, you're going to be ready. If God calls you to something, are you going to be ready? Are you going to be ready? Are you going to be ready? Are you looking inward? 
Are you saying, okay, Lord, I've got a few issues. I'm a dirty vase, but pour in me so I can pour out. And then are you saying, okay, then where do you want me to go? You need to understand that when we get ready to bring this thing together and we close this out officially, that God has something amazing. I'm so glad you didn't ask me success metrics and what does it take to have a good a transition plan. I, I'm so glad you got on your knees and you looked up because I can tell you right now, I run a $100 million business and doing church is not strategy. Doing church is walking by faith. God never gives us all the answers. He says, take the first step, and then I'll show you you can walk on water. Take the first step, and then I'll show you. Pastor Pitts and I are taking the first step, and then he's going to show us. And when it's all said and done, God's going to get the glory. God's going to get the glory. Now, y'all love me? Y'all love me. Y'all love me. I need one more. Y'all love me. Matthew 13. Don't, don't start playing music now. Hold on now. That's, you don't love me. I want you guys to bookmark Matthew 13. 10 to 23. And I want you to read it on your own time. Jesus is having dialogue with his disciples. And they ask them the question. Why do you always talk in parables? Because Isaiah told me they're not going to listen to the gospel. They're going to harden their hearts. And so I'm talking in stories just so that the only people who are tapped into God can understand what I'm saying. No matter how much you try to water it down, only saved folk who God says are going to be saved are going to be able to get our message. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ, not everybody wants it. But we are to go and share that story. And in Matthew, it talks about how it gives the parable, the seed that falls on the roadside and all that. And you guys will get it in your reading and go, ah, I see where he was headed. But ultimately, we need to stay on task. There's somebody who doesn't believe that God called them in the ministry because of their historical perspective. I want to tell you that Jesus paid the price that he can use anybody in the kingdom. You're worried about your outward failures. And God says, I want to pour in you so you can pour out despite your outward appearance. But you have to look inward. And you have to determine to God, God, I'm serious about that. And then what did God call us to do? Many of you, I've been doing chores, and you thought that's the work. You haven't worked on a farm. You have to do work before you have breakfast before you can go do the work. And we've got the work in the church wired. But the work is not internal. It's out there. And the growth of our ministry is not because 25 families come from north to be a part. Our 300 families come from the north to be a part. Our 1,000 families come from the north to be a part of the south. It's because 25 people got saved. 50 people got saved. I want to encourage you today to look up, look in, and look out. If you have a business, if you have a family, if you're starting a family, you have a ministry. You have a purpose that only God and you know about. And when you're called to that purpose, you might have a Isaiah moment. Or you might have a Damascus moment with Paul. And he just pulls you off of the 405 and pulls your car over and has a bright light and shakes you and says, Hey, wake up. I've been asking you to do more. So I want to encourage you today. I want to encourage you, those of you who are watching. I want to encourage you, those who are sitting on the edge of ministry. I want to encourage you to, to say, not only is it it's great for me to sing a song, but it also may be great for me to sing a song out of prison, sing a song out in the streets. It, it, I want to do more, and I want to encourage you. This ministry has great potential. And all the nuances that go around this whole process, as I've 
been a part of a ministry that have 12 couples that is now 3,500. I've sat in room with strategists and consultants and all those things, but you have to stay on your knees so you can get the outcome. And there's nothing more scary in the devil's kingdom than two churches coming together to pick a fight on the unsaved. If you think he's not gearing up, because he says, man, it was fine when they were separate. But now we're coming together, there's more power. I want to pray with you. I want to pray. I want to pray. I want to pray for the North Campus. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for our ministry. I want to pray. Next week, my dad will be able to share a word. But I want to pray. This was my first sermon I've ever preached. Isaiah 6 was the first sermon I ever preached. And when the Lord gave it to me, I said, no, 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 I want a sketcher moment. I want them running around. I want, I want Mother Parchment the hat to fly off. She's running around so much. I want some shouting. I want to get them all excited. And God says, give them a word. Because I know, Pastor Tommy, you feel like you didn't have the same growth that you had in Sacramento. So I know, Pastor Tom, I know you feel like you, you haven't done your job. But I want you to know, Pastor T, you've done your job. Let me tell you what your job was. Your job was to keep it real. Your job was not to waver. Your job was not to get caught up in the political stuff that churches do to grow and to he, just be you. Because they're not going to listen. But I need you to be you. And when that tenth is left, it's a tithe, Brother Charles. It's a tithe from God to humanity. Oh, God. And they think you're consolidating with us. You don't know I'm a tithe into you. You are a tenth to Orange County to become a seed to something bigger. I told Pastor Pitts, let the folks with the books assign assets. I'm handing you my assignment. And there are hundreds and thousands of people who need to be saved. And I want you to tell you that that is bigger than where a chair goes. It's bigger than a balance sheet. What you're about to get, sir, that I'm handing over to you, do not do it lightly. Because the devil does not want people's lives to change. So you are a tenth. God bless you. God bless you. This man who's our host pastor, you need to love him to death. Don't let Jackie walk in here without somebody asking, how are you doing? Because the day he signed up for this gig, the devil said, oh, man, we got one. We got one. His name is Larry Reeves down in Lake Forest. We got one calling all cars. I want you all to be ready. As Pastor Pitts gets outsiders to help us navigate, it's not your assignment to evaluate the process. It's your assignment says, here I am. Send me. Huh? I love you. Every head by every eye closed. There might be someone here who says, Pastor, this word is ministered to me. I know metaphorically you had a much broader meeting, but I'm that vase that don't feel like I'm able to be used. I'm that person who has plugged my ears and not listened to God's call. But today... I want to make a radical change in my approach. I want to pray with you. If you're ready to be sent, right where we are, every head bow, every eye closed, I want you just to stand.
I said, Lord, send me. I don't know where you want me to go. I don't know what you want me to do in this new season, but Lord, send me. I want to pray with you. Lord, I, I, I want to do what you called me to do. I want Pastor Pitts and Pastor Reeves to know that we have people here ready to be sent. Send us. You might think your ministry is getting carved up. You might think it's being rearranged. You are a tenth. You're a till tree. You're an oak tree. You will be a beam holding something up. So Lord, I pray for those who are standing, those who are watching live, who are standing, those who are sitting but standing in their spirit. I bless them. Give them favor. Give them a covering. Guard their households. Guard their mind. Allow them to be the people of God you call them to be. They stand without knowing what success looks like. They stand without knowing what the outcome looks like. They stand without knowing how difficult the assignment. They are standing by faith. So Lord, bless them. Let them know success is not measured with what they see, but what you see. We send them with power and favor and grace. In Christ's name we pray, amen. God bless you. And there might be someone who's watching. I'm hoping one of our college kids calls and says, you know what, my roommate got saved while I was watching when you sent me that $75 gift card, Pastor. But there might be someone watching. We have uh, people watching from Sacramento Church Center Praise Ministries that their prison ministry taps in and shows us in the afternoon and now they can go live and watch. And There might be someone who's sitting there at Hatchby Women's Prison or the Delano Correctional Facility and they might be saying, you know what, I want to just be a part of family pastor time. I'm not ready to stand or raise my hand and volunteer because of my situation, but I'm, I'm ready to, to be a part of the family. I want to pray with you. Being a Christian is the best thing on the planet. And Jesus said, whosoever, anybody who wants to get in, all you have to do is to believe in me. You can have eternal life. Don't worry about being perfect. Worry about being perfected. You fall down, you get up. You fall down, you get up. You fall down, you get up. God is worried about what direction you're falling, not which way you're running. And so I want to encourage you today. Say this simple prayer with me. It's, a, it's an opportunity for you just to find a Bible-believing church. Let the chaplain there know let the correction officer know said hey look i gave my life to christ can i at least send can you send an email just letting them know and pray this prayer we've got counselors who are available at our north campus that can you can tap into and look at our new website coming forward and god's going to bless you when you get out come on in but if you're here in town if you're here in the building simply say this dear jesus send me I believe you died on the cross for my sins. And I believe you rose again for my salvation. I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that God rose you from the dead. And I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Amen. Joel Osteen does that and he does it in a, a lighter version and people used to get on him for his lighter version. I like the thief at the cross. Because the thief at the cross didn't have a new believers class. He didn't use this scripture to get saved. He just said, Will you remember me? And as unorthodox as it is, God doesn't care about the words. He cares about your heart. Somebody just got saved today. Somebody just came to the kingdom of God today, and he is honored. God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful week.
We're going to do a tissue moment next week, so y'all hold that. Okay? It's officially next week. But I love you all. God has been good. And we have something amazing to provide this community. And I can't wait to see the outcome. I can't wait to see what God has in store. But like Paul, I can say I've run my race. And I've finished strong. But I have sometimes looked and said, Lord, how come? And the Lord says, you know how many places you've gone to speak and how the thousands of people that you've ministered to all over the country? You think I'm counting how many people sit in your chairs? I'm counting how many crowns we got to build in our manufacturing plant. And I got angels who are busy because of what you've done indirectly. And you never know. There's a gentleman who sat at Starbucks, and I'll close with this, an elderly man, a grumpy veteran, would never say hi, and I'd walk by and say, how you doing, Mike? How you doing, Mike? He passed away three weeks. I noticed that they had put some flowers on the table that he sit at there in Ladera Ranch. And I was just studying yesterday, and some of the managers moved, and one of them moved to the new place that I was studying. And she said, you know what, Tommy? I go, what? She says, you know what Mike used to do every time you would leave in the morning? He would come and say, why is that guy so nice to me? I said, all I would do was say hi. She goes, you know he had no family. And the only people that he would talk to is he would come here and sit three hours a day. He said, of the hundreds and hundreds of people that walked by, he said, you were one of the very few that said hi to him every morning. I don't know if that's our assignment. Just to be the guy to say hi. We want ministry to be bigger than that and deeper than that. Sometimes it's just to be a smile to someone's face and says, man, God loves you. Amen. You all have a blessed day. I hope you can use this somewhere in your life this week. Deacon Coleman's going to go. You know what? Deacon Coleman is going to come up here and he's going to give us the benediction. It's in Jude, right? Come on up. Come on. Come on. I'm going to stand up here with them. Come on, brother. Let's go. What are you going to do? I'm going to be here with you. You want a microphone? Yeah. Pastor Tommy. Pastor Tommy D. Stewart. <laughs> oh, yes. We enjoyed the message. Truly, God.